Okay, church, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, a little letter that Paul wrote. We're going to spend some time in here the next nine weeks. Lanny Bassam was born in Comanche, Texas, January 2nd, 1947. How many, anybody here from Comanche, Texas? Anybody? I don't see anybody from Comanche, Texas. So by his own description, Lanny wouldn't have been in our gym above me that we talked about earlier, Brian. His own description in sixth grade, he was slow, short, and uncoordinated. That's not me, Brian. Okay. That year was also an Olympic year. And Lanny's teacher one day in front of the whole class says, you know what? Somebody in this class could be an Olympic champion someday. I wonder who it's going to be. Immediately, another kid sitting next to Lanny stands up and says, teacher, I don't know who it's going to be, but I can tell you who it's not going to be, Lanny. Wow. I wonder how many people here Have somebody or something telling you, you cannot be all that God has created you to be. Lanny said that was a turning point in his life. He goes home and he looks at his parents and says, what can I do? And they're like, I don't know. So Lanny, this little sixth grader, puts his mind to work and starts going to the library every day reading about Olympic champions. He said, I, he read and he read and he read, and one thing they all had in common was they all had people telling them they couldn't do what they couldn't do, and all the reasons why they could not do that. Lanny said, as he's studying, he came across this thing called marksmanship, shooting, and they didn't care if you were fast or tall or strong. And he starts getting into this thing, and he gets pretty good at it. In college, he, he's really good. And he thinks, how can I get really, really good at this? Where are the best shooters in our country? And he finds out all those people who are winning the Olympics were coming out of the Army. He joins the Army, and all of a sudden... Almost out of nowhere, in 1972, he's in the Munich Olympics. And he is training with the number one guy in the world who won the Olympics before. And while he's training with this guy, he realizes, I'm better than this guy. I'm going to win this thing. And this guy has everything to lose because he's won it before and Lanny thinks this that guy's going to have a mental breakdown when it comes time he's not going to be able to handle the pressure they get to the Olympics guess who had the mental breakdown it was Lanny and Lanny said that set me on another course I went to a psychologist I said listen I got the silver medal in the Olympics you know nobody's hungrier than a silver medalist right everybody's disappointed when they're the second best in the world. And he says, hey, can you help me? The guy says, you give me six months, oh, I can help you. In six months, you're going to be okay with being the second best in the world. <laughs> Lanny said, I ran out of his office as fast as I could. And he started working on this thing right here. He started working on his attitude and his mindset. Next thing you know, two years later, he's the world champion. Now, in 1976, he shows up for the Olympics, and he wins a gold medal. And he goes from there, and he writes some books, The Winning Mind and Mental Management. He becomes a coach. He becomes a coach for world and Olympic champions, Fortune 500 companies, the U.S. Secret Service, the U.S. Navy SEALs, the U.S. Army Markmanship Unit, the U.S. Marine Corps Markmanship Unit, the FBI, athletes, guitar players, professional golfers, you name it. And he says, here's the one thing I never let them do, direct their own thinking. He says, so I never asked this question. I never asked to a golfer 
I got some golf buddies out here. I, I, I never ask the golfer after their match, how did you do? Because they'll just tell me everything they did wrong. He says, I have three questions to direct their thinking. What went well? What did you learn? And what will you do about it? What went well? What did you learn? What will you do about it? He directs their thinking. I want us to turn this morning to Philippians because God wants to direct your thinking. Amen? You believe that, church? So I want us to say this. God wants to direct my thinking. Let's say it. God wants to direct my thinking. And church, I really believe in this new space, we're still going to do this thing. We're going to go to the Word. And I don't care if we're over there or in here. I don't care if the sound's perfect or not. I don't care if we got to do some rearranging. I want you to know I believe over the next nine weeks, God wants to set some of you in a journey here to change your life. I really do. Because God wants to direct your thinking. And we're going to go to the book of Philippians for that. And some of you are kind of surprised because you say, well, that's not what I thought of when I thought of Philippians. What do we normally think of? What's the one three-letter word? Lots of hints here. What's the one three-letter word we normally think of when we think of the book Philippians? Joy. Thank you very much. I want you to hear there's a reason why you think of joy because 23 times... There's a little Greek word, and that root word shows up 23 times in Philippians. It's charis. Sometimes we associate that with grace, right? And it's translated joy, rejoice, grace. It's translated thanks. It's translated a gift bestowed. And I want to just expand your thoughts about this book. That every time I come across this root Greek word, I'm going to say something like this. Glad and gracious thanksgiving. Okay? Glad and gracious thanksgiving. And that, I want you to think of that as the gold medal kind of life that God wants for you no matter what's going on in your life. Got it? Glad and gracious thanksgiving. Lanny wins a gold medal. He didn't win a gold medal because he said simply, I'm going to win a gold medal. You're not going to experience joy. You're not going to have a glad and gracious Thanksgiving kind of life just because you say, I want it. It's going to come from the fruit of your mindset. Mindset matters. You see, in the book of Philippians, this is just a little overview I'm giving you, okay? There's a word that shows up 11 times. Y'all, I, I, you can tell I, be, I, I geek out of some of these Greek words. I try not to do this to you on Sundays. It's just Philippians. This book is just so jam-packed with stuff, okay? There's, there's this word. It's phroneo. Y'all might know it from Philippians chapter 2. Had this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. You think God's going to change your life if you have the attitude of Christ Jesus? Yes and amen. And it shows up over and over again. Along with that, 24 other times. Times, there's all these thinking words surrounding it. It's words like this, count. How many accountants I have here? They're all sleeping from last week. Okay, seriously. Because of all y'all like me who hand in your forms on Monday and now they're busy doing your extension. But here's what they, you guys were doing at 11 o'clock on Monday night, right? You were counting, you were thinking through, you were adding up the numbers, and I want you to know your mindset matters. And the book of Philippians over and over again says, hey, you want this gold medal kind of life? You're gonna have to do some thinking. And the beautiful thing is, you know, the scripture has been telling us for hundreds and thousands of years what brain science has been telling us the last 30 years, right? Set your mind on things above. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Take every thought captive. That your brain... I was going to use a different illustration, but I got to tell you all, I, I just, I had a fun time laughing at everybody this morning as people were coming in trying to figure out where am I going to sit now? Like the major freak out, right? 
Len Captain switched places about four times. <laughs> Do you know why, Len, you did that? Because your brain, every Sunday used to come in and sit right over there. And your brain is developing these little ruts or grooves, okay? And, and that's how God created our brain, right? And there's chemicals going off in there to help that. And if you feel uncomfortable today, just give it some time. You'll get over it. But I want you to know that God wants to develop some new grooves in your brain here. He wants to direct your thinking to what? A gold medal kind of life. So... Here we go. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 1, and we're just going to walk through 11 verses today. Verse by verse, and we're going to think about love and what our mindset has to say about love. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, what's his second word? Not a trick question. Paul and. And I just want to remind us, because I'm going to come back to this later. It, it is almost, almost, always, always Paul and, right? Paul and Timothy. Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Timothy. And silence. And Paul's not doing this thing on his own. He's building into a next generation. But they are always next to him. I hope you're building into a next generation. I hope you have somebody next to you, Paul and Timothy. Bond servants of who? Okay, church, can I just remind us? Because this is reset time, okay? Christ Jesus. Every time we say Christ Jesus, Christ is not his first name. Christ, title, Messiah. Every time we say Christ Jesus, we are just affirming something huge about our faith. We are saying we believe he is the rightful king of the universe. We believe he is the one and only. We believe he is different from every other teacher. We believe he's the one who can say, no one comes to the Father but through me. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus to all the saints. Love that. God looks at you because of Christ and says you are a saint. All the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Now, since we're talking a little bit about love here, I want to remind us what we know about a church that Paul established in a place called Philippi. Later, you can go back to Acts chapter 16. But when I look at what I've read in Acts 16, and we talk about love here, we're not simply talking about loving our friends loving those who look like us, loving those who are the same social status as us. In the book of Acts, we read about three people who may have been a part of this church. One was a wealthy, non-Jewish woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, business lady. She comes to know Jesus, and she says, Paul, we're going to do it here in my church, my house. Let's have church here in my house. There's also another person we get introduced to. We're not 100% sure about her, but she was caught up in human trafficking. A young gal who had some masters controlling her because she was doing some fortune telling for them, and Paul sets her free. We also have another person who is kind of a blue-collar guy. A Roman centurion got him in jail, a Roman jailer. And, and that jailer, you think about this, he comes out of a polytheistic culture that had all kinds of th things to say about love. Those three people very likely are part of the church Paul's writing to here. And so it goes in verse 2, glad and gracious thanksgivings. Remember I told you when I come across this root word, I'm going to try to say this because I want you to think about this gold medal kind of life that God wants for you. Gl glad and gracious thanksgivings to you and peace from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my 
remembrance of you. Here you see Paul's neural pathways working, always thinking about people. It, the chemicals are going off in his mind. And you know this, church, when you have a good experience with a group of people, how you remember those times and what do you do? You long for it because of something going on in your brain. And it says in verse 4, always offering prayer with yeah, glad and gracious thanksgivings. There's the word again. Always offering prayer with joy, glad and gracious thanksgiving in my every prayer for you all. And I'll just remind you, church, that when Paul is saying this, he's under house arrest. He's not a free man. He's not getting to do what he wants whenever he wants to do it. And he says, I can offer prayer with joy right in the midst of this. Verse 5. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Guys, talk about geeking out over this. You know, this book, that word gospel shows up more times in this letter than any other letter of Paul. Just four chapters. Paul got something on his mind. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, some of your Bibles translate this as fellowship, right? Fellowship, it's the Greek word koinonia. And when I was in college, new believer in Jesus, group of guys I'm hanging out with, and some goofball knew a little bit of Greek, and he, 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 we, he used to like to say, let's go have some coin together. That was our shortened version of koinonia, and we thought it was so cool to say that. We knew Greek. Let's go have some coin. Now, here's what it meant when we said, let's go have some coin together. We were going to go play cards on Friday night because we didn't have nothing else to do and none of us had a date, okay? <laughs> Let's go have some coin together. I want you to know that's not at all what the Bible's talking about here. It's not at all what Paul had in mind when he said, every time I remember you and those synapses are firing in my brain, I'm thanking God for you because of your participation in the Gospel. See, fellowship isn't a bunch of guys going smoking cigarettes out behind the church. I hope we're not doing that, but if we are, it's not that. It's actually some people, koinonia, it, it was a business term, people going into business together. And if two guys bought a boat in the ancient world and one guy said, I'm done with this, and took a chainsaw and cut it in half, you'd have a problem, okay? The, the idea is a group of people who have come together for a common purpose that outweighs their individual preferences, their expectations, and their own personal demands, and says, we are here, church, because we have a commission. We like calling it the Great Commission. It's called having conversations about Jesus throughout all the world. It's saying there's nothing, nothing, nothing greater than for people to understand Jesus Christ. Amen, church? And it's why. That is going to get the best of our attention here. It's why we're going to keep saying, are you having conversations about Jesus? It's why, y'all, I come in here so excited this morning because I had a conversation with somebody about Jesus yesterday, and I'm, I'm going to our app, our Conversations Hub, and I'm plugging in, and I'm rejoicing. It's why Vila gets up this morning and says, hey, I got one to pin, and we, her and I are rejoicing together over that. Your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, verse 6 for I'm confident of this very thing, that he began a good work in you, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is their father. Can you imagine hearing this, their father in the faith? Can you imagine Lanny Bassam hearing somebody say, I'm confident that you're going to do something great. I'm confident you're going to have a gold medal kind of life. I'm confident, church, I don't, know, I don't care how Satan has been lying to you. And I don't care where you're coming from this morning. I am confident because there's a God in heaven who put his Holy Spirit in you, who's given you a word. I am confident. I am confident that you can have a gold medal kind of life marked by glad and gracious thanksgiving no matter what the circumstance. Anybody want to say amen? Here's why. We continue on to verse 7. For it is only right for me to thank some of your Bibles have the word feel there. I, I put think, have this mindset, because there's the word. Same word 
from Philippians chapter 2 when Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And Paul said, I'm doing my own thinking here. It's only right for me to think this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are coiners, koinoneas, (laughs) partakers, fellowshippers of grace with me. God is my witness. I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. See, here's what Paul says. The reason I'm confident that you're going to have a gold medal kind of life is this. I've already seen how you were partakers of grace with me in the gospel. You, You were fully bought in. And you know what Paul is talking about there? He's actually talking about their supporting him financially. He, he says later in the book, in this manner of giving and receiving, no church shared with me but you and alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Paul's talking about real money, real hard currency. So as we think about our mindset about love, I want to say something about love this morning. Real love, real love is made up of hard currency. I want to just challenge our thinking and our squishy notions about love. That it's not just a little bit of a feeling. It's more than something you just go out there and post and let everybody know your opinion about something. Real love is made up of hard currency. You know what I love about this church? This Thursday night, I'll just take this as an example. This past Thursday night, we had a volunteer appreciation at our community center. Real people giving their real time and their real money to love in on some refugees. What I love about this church is years of work in West Dallas alongside Arva Wilson. And I could go on and on because real love, it has hard currency. It's not just talking about the current issue. It's over time investing yourself, listening to someone, even that kind of thing. What's, what's the hard currency of love that you are expressing to each other and to the world? Now, you know, the scripture says there are three things that last. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest things is love. And so we're not surprised in verse 9 that Paul's going to pray about this issue of love. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. And now he's going to load on the thinking words in relationship to love. That your love may abound still more and more in what? What's your Bible say? Real knowledge, all discernment, so that you may approve. These are all thinking words, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. That word sincere, it's a word, two words. It's the word judge and it's the word son. That the son can shine a light and say, yes. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, the sum of all goodness, that you have been filled with the fruit of the sum of all goodness which came through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, let me say, how many here can remember a song, most of you are old enough, from 20 years ago? Okay, how many, raise your hand high, okay, show how old you are. You can remember a song from 20 years ago. Y'all, there was a song that came out when I was four years old. I heard it for the first time when I was seven years old, okay? That's 54 years ago. It goes something like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Peyton, can you give me a little back up here? Uh, (laughs) Lord, we don't need another mountain. There are mountains and hills to climb, right? Right? We don't need another stream to cross or ocean. There's enough of those for the end of time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone, okay? How many heard that song before? 
gosh. And if you didn't raise your hand because you heard those words, you've heard it from Taylor Swift and others who are just singing their own version of that, right? And I want you to know Paul says, yeah, that is true, but we make sure that our definition of love is informed by the real knowledge and discernment of this Bible. Because, hey, I'll just remind us right now, y'all, there are four voices speaking to us all the time. Three aren't so good. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And the world's, when we say the world, we're talking about a world system that wants to say something to you about love that is not in accordance with the word of God. Your flesh wants to do what it wants to do, and it will come up with all kind of crazy ideas about what love is, whatever is your issue in the moment. And the devil, who we know is the father of lies, and that's how he operates. And church, I, I'm not gonna go through different kinds of love. Here's what I'm asking us to do, church. If we believe this is true, that we want love that's real knowledge and all discernment, that you would be at least willing to say, is it really true? Just because I've heard it a million times, just because our culture is saying it over and over, just because there's a whole flock of people who once believed in Jesus and once believed in what he said and what this word said is true love, just because they're running out the back door, I want to ask you to at least stop before you join the crowd and say, is this real knowledge and all discernment? You know the word real knowledge? We talk about in chapter 3, I want to know Christ. That's the word. And then they put a preposition on it to say, like intense knowledge that comes into you. And, and you know, you're thinking about enough that it, you, it does make sense to you. And you say, yes, that is true. Discernment. I, see, this is, yo, know, I'm not just challenging you because I, I want to challenge you. I'm challenging you because the scripture does. That word discernment, it's the idea that you got some coins in your hand and you're saying, wow, are these worth really anything here? Is this made of aluminum or copper or silver or gold? And who, who printed this? That's, the, that's what the scripture is asking us to do. So let me say it this way. Love, love needs the power of clear thinking. Love needs the power of clear thinking. The mind of Christ. So let me give us this challenge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this today by a challenge for the next eight to nine weeks, okay? I'm gonna remind you, I'm gonna build on this. I wanna say three things. If you believe what the scripture says, that you would do this, that you would, one, memorize some scripture over the next eight to nine weeks. You, I wanna ask you to do something from Philippians. You could do just a couple verses from chapter 4, 6, and 7 that says whatever's true, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good repute, if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. You know what's interesting about that verse, y'all? Remember Lanny Bassam asked those questions, would you do well? Whatever's true, whatever's right, whatever's lovely. And then he asked, um, what did you learn? The next verse, Paul says, the things you've learned and heard and received in me. And then he asks, what, what will you do? What will you practice? Then Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Church, think about this. If we just said, we're gonna do that everywhere we go, do you think the church would look different? Whatever's true, right, pure, lovely. Or for some of you who want a bigger chunk, you could do Philippians chapter two that I've quoted a couple times where right in the middle it says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That has to do with our relationships. You think we'd be different? Now, because some of you, I know it is hard to believe this idea about a gold medal life could be yours, glad and gracious Thanksgiving. I wanna give some of you a bigger challenge and I'm not kidding when I say this, okay? Memorize the whole book of Philippians. Okay, who's in? 
Y'all, I'm not kidding when I say this. And I have, I believe 100% that every person here can do it. I, I really do. And, 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 and I say that because it's going to take that level of effort to rewire some of our brains. But it can be done because the scripture says it can be done. You see, I grew up, I'm going to just tell you this story. I grew up. Every night, I went to bed as tense as I could be, pretty afraid. Get up in the morning. My first thought is, whew, am I going to make it through this day? When I was in college, when I was in high school and college, I started living a life just letting what the world says about love guide my actions because what the world needs now is love sweet love oh, I believe that that's what I needed and I remember I'd wake up in the morning I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I, my mind's going on things that I'm not very proud about and I didn't want to be a part of my life somebody gave me this challenge I start memorizing the book of Philippians and I still remember the day like it was yesterday when I woke up at one in the morning and I wasn't thinking about everything that I thought about in the past. Here's what I was thinking about. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. It's only right for me to feel this way about you all. Because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I ain't got time to do the whole book right now. But I know you can do it. I know it can happen. Let me tell you second thing. I'm going to talk more about how that can happen next week. I'll let you go home and be frustrated a little bit as you work on it. <laughs> second thing, you find a friend. Y'all, it's not going to happen without a friend. Paul and Timothy. Whether they do it with you or not, whether it's one verse, ten verses, or the whole book, you find a friend, at least you tell that friend every day, I, I, I did it. Okay? Or I didn't do it, but I'm going to pick it up again tomorrow. I'm just not going to go two days without it. And then thirdly, I want to encourage you, you got to eliminate something. I meant to bring my cell phone up here. Y'all, I will tell you, I would have never memorized the book of Philippians if I'd had a cell phone. When I was a college student, no way I know myself. There's no way. Too much distraction. I'm not saying you got to give me your cell phone today, but I will give you 10 bucks for it. Um, but you got to eliminate something, okay? The goofy videos I can watch on that cell phone. Civil engineering videos. How you get a rusty bolt off a nut when you don't have the right size wrench. I'm going to go to Home Depot or I'm going to ask somebody else to do it, right? But I got to watch those videos. You got to eliminate something. Lanny Bassam, y'all. That guy is in the Hall of Fame of shooting in the United States third highest medal ranking guy ever in U.S. history. Here's what he did. Remember I told you he went off? He ran out of the psychologist's office. You know what he did? He started interviewing Olympic champions. And he said, I got information from them nobody was getting. Church, there's information available to you that no one else is getting. Let's pray. For your honor, for your glory, we pray, Father, you would give us the mind of Jesus, that you would give us the encouragement of this body here, 
that we would allow you to direct our thinking in Jesus' name, amen.